Alrighty, here we go with, we'll get started. Third column for some thread locker. And then all we're gonna do, we're gonna take a screw and mount it to the aluminum base plate that we have down here. Heated bed is sitting on this aluminum plate. There's a corner any tool. So this screw will go on the bottom side. Then we have what appears to be a, some sort of plastic, probably heat isolator, maybe a little bit of shock, not really sure. We're gonna throw in a washer and then a longer screw that's gonna go through heated bed. Though I'm starting to wonder, why is the screw coming up through the thick piece of aluminum short and the screw that goes through the heated bed long? Maybe we'll check that. All right, reverse. We are putting big screw, long screw, not necessarily big, long screw through thick piece with no washer and then attaching this standoff and then we're gonna put a washer around the hot plate, heated bed. Um, it looks like there are slots here so there will be a little bit of alignment that we can do, but otherwise it's gonna be secured without any adjustment capability uh, to this bed. I guess we'll just have to be fine with anything, but I think that's part of what these washers are for. So if there is any adjustments that need to be, we can change what side of the bed these washers will set on in order to raise, lower, counter any sort of inaccuracies with mounting to this uh, main plate. Most of that should have already been taken care of whenever we mounted it to our Z axis. We really shouldn't have to worry about that like at all. Let's just get to assembly. Now it does say to start with these being loose. I'd agree. Uh, I mean, that's the same process that I've been doing throughout all of this. Always start with loose or at least not fully tightened units uh, to assemble everything. And then the last thing you want to do is actually tighten everything down uh, per assembly. Like you don't have to wait till this entire thing's built to go through and double check everything. Build everything, double check everything, and then go through and triple check everything. Definitely worth just tacking the torques on everything. It shouldn't be an issue, but better safe than sorry. Just rotate this. Um, it said to slide it in, but I'm a dangerous fella. Not really, at least don't tell anyone. So we're gonna go ahead and set these up. We'll also set our screws up and send the other four uh, washers that we have back to their homes which means that we probably use the wrong screws for this but that's a uh, it's a thing it's not like it's really going to affect anything uh if we run out of screws in a different portion we will just dig around until we find them or go acquire them i really hope that you're not a person expecting this to be like your only use 3D printer. This is definitely only a 3D printer meant for tinkers who have had some sort of experience and plan to do a lot with it. If you're going to go get this printer, I highly recommend getting an Ender 3. Um, and I say that because it's not a Prusa. It's not perfect. Get it stocked. Don't get any sort of upgrades with it. Bare bones, stock as possible. And then Go play with that for a while. Get familiar with upgrading anything, software, what kind of requirements. Because you know it's gonna work, but it's not gonna be perfect. Whereas a Prusa, you get it, and you kinda half expect it to be pretty much running next to perfect right out of the box. Yes, there's things you can do to it, but you really don't ever have to do anything to get it to print like stupid well for the price range. Whereas the Ender 3 is a little bit more troublesome. That's where having some beginning knowledge is going to come in really, really useful. Um, I did not use Loctite on this and that's because these are downward facing screws. I realized that there might be a little bit of motion imposed through uh, a hot end moving across this and whatnot. Uh, it's not a downward facing screw where it's going to fall out. It's going to sit here. I don't want it to actually clamp on this bed. I don't know what this is made of and I don't know what it can take, but I don't want to have an issue with that or the fact that we're using plastic sand instead of metal ones. I realize that it has a low conductivity, but stainless steel honestly has such a low heat conductivity that it really doesn't matter either. Although they might have done it because it has next to no expansion property. Um, I could definitely see that if those heat up, they might not expand at all, which would not give this any additional out of whack. Or heck, it might even shrink to help compensate. I, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason why they went with plastic standoffs and I might just be overblowing it. Uh, at this point, uh, while I am curious, I'm not that curious, so I will let it be and get about to snugging this up. It's entirely up to you if you want to use Loctite. Honestly, probably the smartest thing to do. I probably will here in a second as well. But the other thing is like, I really don't see a need to use Loctite, Loctite on plastic threads because at the point that you lock a screw down into metal, 
your torque and holding capability is actually coming from stretching the screw and it the screw itself causes a springy action of which causes a constant uh, pressure even throughout any sort of vibration to prevent any back movement. It's not like the screw is just super, super hard and it will never stretch. And so any vibration in the other material will cause play and allow it to back out. Screws are meant to actually be stretched. Bolts are meant to be stretched to a very specific standard. But the problem is whenever you thread it into plastic, it will deform far sooner than steel or aluminum ever will. And so you get a similar effect, but that effect is coming from the threads in the plastic part instead of from shaft of the bolt. And so it, there's really no need for Loctite in that scenario because Loctite just, it, it's a dampener, yes. There's just sufficient deformation in any even low torque applications like this with the plastic that it's really overkill. And it's more of a super glue than it is a uh, Loctite at that point. Not saying it won't come undone, but it's just completely overkill. And in my opinion, uh, completely unnecessary. And there is a glass topper that goes with this. It looks like there's some sort of a pin here. It's threaded, it's threaded the hole. Definitely gonna end up mounting something there. I don't know what, I don't know why. Interesting. It could actually end up being like a uh, wire holder to help take the strain relief off of these wires. <laughs> or it could be something for the glass bed. I, I don't know. But for now this, uh, I really needed it mounted for the wires. Wires are mounted, started to be run. And so our next step can be to actually run the wires through the, I forget what you call it, it's like a wire chain or something like that, cable carrier to allow the movement and prevent any sort of uh, interference from the cables getting where they shouldn't belong, or they don't belong. That being said, we are ready to jump right into wires. I say that, but you're stopping, I'm going. We're setting this up. <laughs> See you in a sec. Just kidding. They immediately want us to use 3D printing parts. I'm gonna go start the uh, print needed for the wire kit and then uh, all it is is for a uh, cable plug. All it's gonna be for is to uh, be a catch for this. And then I think there's one other usage. Uh, really, that's it. There might be some cable holders and some other things, but this is all called out. I'll double check throughout, but we should be able to run most of the wires without having the printed parts done and then add them in later, and especially that kind of part. All right, uh, still waiting on parts to finish up for ACN, but these are the cables that we're gonna end up using for ACN. It'll be a plug that'll sit down here, run to our power supply. So I'll leave that be. Then we have DC and ground. So we'll start with those, make sure we have our main power supplies uh, provided, and uh, from there we can add in all of our extra cables of which I will say E3D did a phenomenal job with packaging labeled on the bags But there's plenty labeled on wires themselves and then they're also already put into snakeskin bound heat shrunk Connected, uh, twisted. I mean, your last bit. Really well done. Really well done. And just real quick for AC versus DC. AC in your common household is typically going to be a white for your neutral and then a colored wire that is not green for any of your powered wire and then you're going to have green as your ground your safety wire and so uh, a lot of times or maybe not a lot but there are times when ac and dc start to get a little bit confusing because in household, black is one of the colored wires. And so it is known to be powered. And red is more light and closer to white, but that's not the case with uh, DC. DC, uh, black and green are your neutral and your ground. They usually call black a ground as well. It'd be kind of interesting to actually call black a neutral, but it is a standard color for running to ground from DC. Uh, and then your colored wires, are going to be and typically your main power wire is going to be red and then any like auxiliary wires are going to be whatever different color you want usually avoiding but that's not always the case it's green is kind of a hit or miss for how much it's actually used in dc for ground um, that is primarily an ac color and so i just wanted to kind of clear that up and it's going to be really confusing because the only known color that they use in here 
is green for ground and then they use a brown and a blue but they do that because they don't want you to be thinking black is hot on here and then black is like it might be hot on dc like you will absolutely fry electronic fuel reverse something and it's just it's not going to be happy so i do appreciate the forethought and making that color scheme a little non-standard in order to make sure that it's noticeable when it comes time to wire wiring that <laughs> no mistakes will be accidentally made on their behalf another really cool thing is they're using these uh actual crimp connectors they already like pre-crimped the copper wire it looks like stranded copper wire with this uh, connector and then this will actually be used on these terminal blocks and be clamped down onto again instead of something like a fork that we see used a lot with power supply and this is very handy because now i never have to worry about frayed wires stray wires and there should be you should be able to get a good amount of clamping force onto here and it will effectively be the same as uh, clamping down on the wires themselves it implies a really good contact i wouldn't be surprised if we see more of these coming about in the future in replacing our forked and our pilot terminals but now uh, <laughs> they're just being introduced and it's really nice to see that they're being used i haven't looked into how long these have been around but i haven't seen them before maybe 10 years ago and even then i, I might just be making it up I, I doubt i even saw it 10 years ago anywho let's get to assembling wiring and making this big boy work the power supply has the very standard you have phillips and uh flathead or slotted combo screws and that is important just to make sure that you always have the right uh, tool on hand but then looking at the duet threes there's uh only slotted heads for this and so i'll be grabbing a slotted head but whenever possible i will be using a phillips driver as it increases reliability generally makes for uh, less slippage and less slippage means less distortion of screws, which means that I can actually get them out. It looks like we will be running a couple of separate grounds to this ground screw on the power supply. Uh, we will have the ground for uh, DC as well as the ground for AC. Although it looks like they have a power supply earth instead of ground. Checking back, all it does is it runs it to a V minus which is instead of an actual label to ground, I would have liked to have seen a V minus tag on here. Like I understand that, yes, it's uh, depending on how the power supply is set up, it is an acceptable way to run ground to V minus, but there's also no indication that this particular setup is actually using V minus or voltage low as a, uh, a ground or a zero voltage. But I think they do separate it. It should be a zero voltage and they separate it to help out with keeping the, the alternating current from seeping into the system, even through the ground. As unlikely that, as that might sound, uh, it is every bit possible. All right, so this is labeled uh, VIN, voltage in. Um, I see a positive mark for this terminal, and then there, here's another VIN, and then this is actually bed heat, so that's actually a power out. All right, voltage in, voltage out, voltage in. Um, they're not even labeling it that as plus or minus. I don't like how this is loose on here. I think there's typically a way that you can actually secure these to the boards, but right now this is relying solely on the solder terminals. And while that's not deal, it's kind of a if for no other reason than now there's torque being applied to those traces. And if that ever breaks off and it's weakened because it's not attached plastic to the board with any sort of glue or adhesive, it's in a fairly weak state compared to what it could not fond of that. But I also understand that it's probably not something that's ever going to be like over abused it's an extra cost at that point plus it's kind of a design failure maybe i would hope not for a uh, quality of product that this is supposed to be um the other unique thing to look at here is positives and negatives are on opposite sides for these two voltage in units this one does have a clearly labeled a uh, negative um and positive whereas this only has a moderately clear label for positive always pay attention to what you're running you'll be fine I do like these uh, connections to be pretty pretty tight, if at all possible. And I do recommend people to also do this. Just a quick tip on that too. The way to know if you're over tightening or under tightening or any sort of not quite right with 
any bolt really, although it's a lot easier to tell with small bolts than it is with large bolts, is when, if it starts to strip or starts to fail, there will be a point of which torque stops increasing and it will level off. Look for a level off point to stop at because you can still rely on those threads pretty well for the most part to actually hold it in. Like you're still at a max torque at that point. But shortly after that leveling off is gonna be an actual decline of torque required to fasten the screw. And that's usually when you know you've gone too far and you've degraded the threads to the point of which they will never hold the same amount as what they would have as if you hadn't gone that far. Definitely a good thing to keep in mind and it's a good way to check for like how tight, especially on a lot of these small fasteners. And then if you get really good, you can still uh, catch the fasteners on like the ramp up portion before it's like, oh, okay, well, I know it's about this size of fastener. I can put about this much torque into it and you never even reach that plateau. Uh, you really don't want to reach that plateau because that's starting of spread manipulation probably shouldn't be going on. If you do reach it, as long as you don't have to like take it out, put it back in, like uh, use that thread a whole bunch more, uh, you should be fine. If it is a highly used thread, uh, that's a good sign that it's about time to replace it. Red is hooked up to all of my positives. Black is hooked up to all my negatives. And that is just one of many times that we are gonna be checking that. And this unit here is actually gonna be a solid state relay for powering the bed, which means that all the controller is gonna do is turn this on and then it's going to basically switch on uh, so this is dc input and it's going to turn on a relay for a ac throughput and that ac throughput is going to be what powers our board which is rated for 110 ac i imagine they have a second board that's actually meant for 220 setups and which is fine uh, but they can use the same part here as this goes up to 240. the interesting thing though is this is only rated for uh, 10 amps where the heated bed is rated for just under 40. oh never mind yeah, this is well over what the hot bed is rated for. Because this will come out to, if you're using 110 up to 10 amps, that's a uh, little over a thousand watt. And the bed's rated for 800, so we're fine there. The limiting factor is still the power supply, which is okay. Uh, power supply is going to be if needed, and hopefully it doesn't even come to that. Here, and it's kind of interesting, we're, we're still going to use this bed heat, but I find it interesting that they're using such a large terminal for bed heat, but it might be needed in order to make and break this connection, this uh, 110 at 10 amps. Shouldn't it need a significant amount of current, but it might, and so they're providing it as a just-in-case scenario. Not really sure about what's going on there, but they're definitely not running this terminal block to its max capacity or these wires. And if they are in order to hold on that, uh, so with the relay, you're actually holding that open, which is a good indicator <laughs> that they're not using full power. Because if you use full power to hold this relay, I guess, closed and to make this connection, then you're going to be drawing a good amount of current from the power supply, reducing the amount of current available to you to your heated bed. And that would reduce the load and necessity of having something powerful in order to break it. All right, double check. Uh, bed heat is oriented the same way as this vent where positive is on top side and negative is on the bottom. Negative goes over to negative, positive goes to positive. Uh, we're set there. Oh mama. All right, <laughs> I just realized something. They're not using the power supply as an intermediate device for this heated bed. It's separate. The power supply only does the rest of the configuration. The 110 coming into the power supply is branched off at the power supply to come into here, which then goes directly to the bed. That means that there won't be any sort of limiting capacity or safety effect at this power supply. It will rely solely on the fuse coming in for uh, at our plug. And as much as, I don't know, I'm a little torn on that, but it's not terrible. 250 volt fuse. I'm curious what these fuses are rated for. But now we're talking about a close to 800 watt power supply. If you're running 110 or 115 at 6.8, yeah, it's about 800 watts. And a 800 watt bed. Because now you're using the full potential of this bed. Like it will max out as soon as you turn this on. So you're talking good uh, 1600 watts. And this does not look like a fuse that can handle 1600 watts. F5AL, five amp. Power in is five amp. And you're trying to carry, I mean, the heated bed alone is one of five amps. As we just discussed, it's closer to seven. All right, this is a 12 amp. So they did send two different fuse sizes that explains a little bit here. This is underneath, this is rated for underneath the uh, entire usage of the system itself. And since this has been shown to work in other, like 
someone else has already built it, has made it work, and it operates fine without blowing a fuse. We can definitely say that we're safe when it comes to using the power supply and the heated bed together. I'm guessing that the power supply never reaches that its full potential or even close to it, at least while the uh, bed is heating up. I don't know how that's going to play into effect if things start switching over to a heated chamber, but I think the idea is you're going to have a ramp period where you're at, at cold. Um, none of your nozzles really need to be on or operating fully up until your bed or your heat chamber is uh, fully heated. And so there's no need for both this power supply to be pumping juice to uh, your hot ends as well as to, it will run it to the stepper motors in order to lock them in place for the most part. Usually that is one of the key things as a home, which means that the steppers are powered on and locked into whatever position they decide to hold. And then you're heating the bed. So you do have those two currents, but you don't have hot end and you're not gonna have end defectors or anything else if you're gonna be using a heated chamber. So it's very unlikely that we're gonna end up running into an issue with a 12 amp fuse, even though that's under the entire capacity of this uh, machine. And so that way it's kind of an iffy balance to make because 12 amps is larger than this uh, individual load of a maximum 10 amp. I don't know what would happen if you would deploy this load, but at the same time, this is larger than our heated bed which means that the heated bed shouldn't, in normal operations, exceed seven amps. Uh, it shouldn't exceed eight amps in normal operation. And which means that this should never be exceeded, which means that that fuse should never be exceeded. But things can always fail. The heated bed will be the part that fails. I don't know what will happen if this fails because the heated bed fails. This is not rated as a fuse and it does have a max uh, current rating, but that's a stated, which means that manufacturers are likely pushing over. So it probably has a max usable, non-usable safety rating of 15 amps. Uh, I'd say somewhere between 12 and 15 amps at least, which means that its max rating is now the equivalent of the fuse's max rating. And that is acceptable. Um, same goes with this power supply. It itself is likely fused as well, which helps. At the same time, if it does go over its manufacturer specs, it does have a maximum limit of which probably gets pretty close to at least 10 amps it might actually get a 12 in order to blow the fuse by itself and so that does sound like a pretty solid intermediate number to keep everything safe personally i would have the two systems separated and had an inline fuse for this and then either had an accessible or a separate inline fuse for this but not everyone likes to have multiple fuses to take care of or worry about Whereas this, it'll always be on the outside of the machine, set up as a plug, and you can pull this out whenever you need to in order to reset your fuse. Seeing as it's pretty simple to figure out, they want bed wiring to run. The wires are coming off the back of the bed. They want the wiring to go into the cable chain here, up and around and out of this hole, of which we will run it to wherever our destinations are from there. And then at some point, we'll also be running a ground down into there, allegedly. Um, I don't see a ground being run, and maybe that's the blue. They just used the uh, chassis ground for the bed. Holy shit, that's a lot of current to push through there. I really hope not. Uh, I will start by running all of the uh, cables through here, and uh, the plan being to have, make sure that anything for that bed is only touching the AC circuit. I don't want it touching using any sort of the electronics ground because they have clearly identified that it is a separate unit from the rest of the system aside from this one um, control unit and so i want to make sure that it doesn't touch a chassis ground it doesn't touch even the voltage low or something like that it needs to touch the natural ground of which the same pin for the power cord coming in goes to the wall at like this the exact same ground so it doesn't touch the rest of the system if something is to fail i'm just going to go ahead and route these cables and get back to you here in short for running these i'm lazy so so what I'm going to do is actually run a little bit of masking tape. I can get this up into your view here. Uh, we have our four wires. At first I thought that these ends might have been soldered already, but they're not. That would have just really made my day, especially after seeing the crimp connectors. I really don't see anything that's soldered on the system, so it might not have been a local option. But all I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some tape here, and then I'm going to taper it upwards. And this will help bring a little bit of tape and security up to the top side of this set of wires and drill nice like. Now we have a fishing line. It'll just make everything just a little bit better and if we want, we can even bend this a little bit to provide like a natural curve to fish around the chain. It's also nice because uh, we're pushing on four wires here, which means that we can actually get some force with uh, 
getting them to travel along the path that we want um, actually moves through. If we're trying to do this by individual wires, and our tape just came off because I tried pulling on it, which was silly. And I really didn't grab it that hard. So that was on me. That made that a breeze, just an absolute breeze. And then I'm just gonna leave these like kind of loose in the system and then uh, figure out where they need to run from here. It looks like red is our heated bed actually. And then blue should be our thermistor. It has an integrated thermistor somewhere in that packaging, which is nice. That means that I don't have to assemble it. I don't have to worry about messing something up. And that's part, it's already calibrated. Ish, not really. I'm curious if they're actually gonna have us calibrate that hotbed. And what we have here is just a small bit of end, and we're going to be using this to power this bit, this uh, hotbed. It's surprising just how much current they're pushing through here, but it's fine. It's, although the, these are probably definitely just overrated. But having been around the electric cord that just burned up, uh, replacement end was put on it, crimped too much, and it managed to squish the pot and the ground together. So it turns out that the pieces that were crimping weren't rubber, they were a hard plastic and it crimped the pot and the ground together and caught like enough where it went copper to copper and caused the short at the very like at the receptacle end of the cord and this is a good 50 100 foot cord so it fried the ground and the hot on that cord all the way down the cord and back completely ruined it but it is definitely very important to get these terminals right i might actually like to see if i have a terminal kit and crimp on my own terminals because that would be much preferred to uh, just using it as a bare wire and being clamped in. Yeah, I'm going to go do that. All right, those are located in a location that I really didn't want to mess with getting to right now. I'm going to just go ahead and strip these to be a little bit longer. I know use a, most people prefer to use like an actual stripping mechanism for this. Um, I've always found that these small notches in the serrated blade work perfectly fine for me. So that's the option that I am opting for. And I realize that I do this at my own risk and I have cut myself before doing it. It's not my place to tell you how to do what you want. So please let me do what I've been doing for 12, 15 years. I've always had a good amount of luck with it. So it does take a stiff uh, thumb to do this. And this seems to be a pretty nice um, wire. I've definitely had softer wires, speaker wires specifically. Quite hazardous because the wire itself is just so soft and thin. It makes it real easy to just cut through the wire and then straight into your thumb or whatever PCI backing it. Thumb, finger, hopefully neither if you do it right. Um, but anywho, uh, looks like it's agnostic as to direction. So we're going to choose, uh, we're going to have power in come here and we're going to have power out be number two. So it's uh, power in is one, power out is two. And then it's nice because these are clamp plates in here. It's not, I don't have to deal with the screw and wrapping uh, the wire around a specific screw or something. But that is itself pretty handy. And then I'm not going to actually clamp it, but this does go to uh, neutral. So what I'll end up doing is I'll have line or the hot 110. It will come, it'll branch off of our uh, 110 positive thermal here, hot thermal. It'll run to this guy and then we'll make a connection saying yes you can pass and so it'll pass down through the heating bed and it'll come back up and it'll go straight to neutral. Neutral is designed to take it. I want this to be the difference between the wall outlet and uh, the hot plate. You could also technically do it where this is the difference between the hot plate and ground where there's always power going to that heating element and then it comes to here to be connected to ground and old vehicles actually used to be set up that way where everything was powered and your switches actually set it to go to ground but i like blocking power going from my objects instead of blocking the power in my objects from going somewhere else technically it worked the same it's just the fail safes are a little bit different definitely better in my opinion okay we have a b motor no idea what a B motor is. It doesn't define if it's X, if it's Y, if it's Z. Um, that's one thing that I will say could have been done a little bit better. It's because you have a fully machined plate like this, if you had taken the time to carve in an X and a Y for each of the motors, uh, I realize it doesn't really work that way with an XY carriage assembly in, in this manner. Even on my uh, Delta printer, those are labeled X, Y, and Z, which means that you have a defined point of connection. Whereas right now I'm just like, uh, sure, let's go for a motor. Okay, even better. Um, it just does Y motor to a B motor, Z motor to Z motor. Hey, at least that one's labeled. And then X motor to an A motor. So B goes to Y apparently. According to pictures, of which you can't really see clearly, but you can see it better on the A motor. So let's, let's do A motor first. Um, a motor, the motor where 
the uh, pulley on it as closest to the actual stepper motor itself. So <laughs> that's literally the only defining object that we have to go off of here. Um, we could base it on left and right, but I don't trust left and right in pictures or that being an option. And so this is defined lower, which means that it's gonna run the same belt system as what's in the provided instructions. So this should pretty be pretty straightforward. It's a six pin connector with only four pins connected due to the style of motor and how it is designed to be run for this system. Uh, there are labels on here and it seems like they're on the right side of the pinouts or of the connectors. So there's two labels here, a E1, an E0, an X, a Y, and a Z. So I'm pretty sure that's where apparently they don't want to soak it up right away. Well look, they even have a double um, label here. So they have a Y motor, X motor, E motor, E motor, and then probably a Z motor that's not labeled on the actual uh, controlling chips themselves. I like that, it's beautiful. We're just gonna choose X, which is this middle one. And then running it underneath the power cables is a personal uh, decision of mine because I have a feeling that like these are already raised up and this cable um, will be brought down next to the acrylic. And so that way it's not interfering with these cables at all. It kind of looks like a person can actually run these power cables inside of the T-slots and get like a really nice clean look out of that. I like that, I'm gonna do that. Oh, uh, look at that clean up so nicely already. And we're just getting started. And we're not even supposed to be cleaning stuff up yet. <laughs> All right, we got our Y motor, goes to A motor, no nope, B motor. The B motor is the one where the uh, pulley is reversed and uh, so the set screws on the bottom, the pulley sits higher and the standoffs aren't as great for this motor. We'll go ahead and plug him in. Route this uh, cabling somewhere, doesn't really matter. Um, this is Y, so we will put it on Y here. Now we have two motors uh, already wired up. And then we have one more motor to do, and that's C motor. So this goes back to proper alignment of this panel. Definitely the most major part of making sure that this panel didn't get installed upside down is this hole right here. And I tried pointing it out in the video, but there's a hole right here that goes on the same side as the terminal for the stepper motor. And so that's hugely important because if that goes on the wrong side, if it goes over on your side, then now I'd have to reroute the cable or take everything apart, flip the, really you'd have to flip the entire thing over or get a little creative. But creative, while provides a solution, usually doesn't provide a uh, beautiful solution. I'm not here to go for the mundane, per se, or messy. I'll try to do what I can to actually tie these cables up nicely. And it looks like this uh, cable can be slid down next to these uh, power cables real nice. Like, of course, I don't want to cause too much bind either direction. And I might actually get a better run out of this if I go under these power cables. See how this goes around the underside? That side being under. I'm actually going to unplug and reroute this. Plug it back in, route it underneath these power uh, wires, and then run the power wires on top. Tuck it all nicely down. Oh, that is gorgeous. I have a cable cover for this motor right here. In progress, I'm, it's done technically, but I'm not gonna pull it off of a running print. But they do have a nice little cover that will go for this cable system. Just keep all of the cables at least protected. And then we have extruder cables. We only need one set. This will be zero. Zero, one, two, three. So I'm looking for tool two. Assuming they started at zero. This package has cables for only motors. The guide I'm following is for the button setup. So I'll get one done with that. For those that might be a little unfamiliar why you do a T0 instead of a T1 as your first motor is in logic, you run in binary. So your first number in any system that you create, especially in a array. So if you have an array, which is like five numbers, let's say we want it to be one, eight, two, five, seven. So in that array, you, you have a first identifying number, but usually computer, well, computers only operate in binary, which is uh, on and off or one and zero. While we might start our decimal system at one, a, another way to look at it, because like our decimal system, we usually count as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But we carry on the ten. And so the way that this is effectively doing it is saying, we're not going to include that ten or that carry as a part of our ten numbers. So we're going to start before the carry. Uh, so we're going to do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that is 10 number, but it starts at 0. And then what happens is you get a carry when you do 10. And so you have a 1, 0. And then 
11, 12. So you have a carry plus uh, your repeat of the zero through nine. And so it does the same way here with any sort of array you do, it always starts at zero. It gets a little confusing, at least until you kind of like get used to it. It's never something that you really fully expect and especially because the world is comprised of a bunch of arrays that start at zero and a bunch of arrays that start at one. We haven't gone either way and so it's confusing about which way and who's doing what. But for this system, everything is gonna be starting at zero and because it's a digitally designed system, and that includes numbering our motors for our extruders. We have zero, one, two, three. And so I grab an E2, which means that it is our third motor and I get to connect it. We're gonna have to arbitrarily choose something. Nothing is called out in the manual, mostly because this is where the tool changer and its unique design starts to get a little funky. We're gonna do this in a bit of unique fashion. And we're gonna use the tape and a marker to identify what motor goes to what pinout selection. Real quick, just to identify, um, we have five pinouts here, um, and these are two supported extruders. I think the cables provided for uh, the first two, uh, extruder zero and extruder one, may actually run down to here. Um, but clearly this cable, we're not gonna be able to reach there, especially in any nice design. So we're gonna start at the top of this pin out here. And we know that these are the same outputs because they use the same control boards here. And then also uh, this starts at zero. So we have zero, one, two, three, four, and then it goes up to five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so it's a direct continuation. So we can use any of these to control motors. Uh, we're gonna do exactly that. And because this is tool three and T2, or I guess E2, I'm gonna start at nine and go down as my organization and then this pinout will be left empty and used for some other use case. So what I'm going to do is wrap this around real quick and then drop it down into these pins. For now I'm going to indicate that this, is, I mean obviously we can follow it, but for clarity's sake just do a little tag here if I can. All right, D8 on here. And then now we have an identifier for this particular stepper. And this will make it a lot easier whenever we go into the code and define, hey, uh, what's my extruder stepper for this particular tool? Uh, I can just look at this and be set. And I don't have to go and squint and, or remember or anything, it's just, it's here. So we have one more to run, and that's for our direct drive Hamara. That, I believe, has a separate cable system somewhere. Keyword somewhere. So we have a long cable and a converter Board. It's a six pin joiner board that will allow us to make sure that this is configured properly for the circuit board. But this is one of the unique things about why I'm doing this as a hot in Hamera side by side. Uh, we're starting to get into grounds and we should be able to do this real quick. So we have three wires. This is a bed ground. So this is the fun one that we get to run through yeah, the cable chain. And then we have a power supply unit ground and a bed ground. So that goes to frame, a bed ground that goes to PSU ground. So we have a power supply ground and that will go to frame. So the entire chassis of this is actually connected to the main ground for safety reasons. And all we have to do is use one of the mounting screw holes here, mount the power supply unit to ground. Uh, it looks like there's four holes on this side, so our pleasure for choosing which one we want. Nothing is specified as ground. I'm gonna be happy with that. Now, the one thing that I don't like about instructions is it doesn't have us connecting. Whenever we connect this side of the cable, to ground, it utilizes a washer in between the, between the cable and this. I wanna see if I can't run this ground down to here. So from my experience, like yes, this is conductive, should last a while, but this is your primary ground for the entire chassis. So if that bed is too short, yes, there's supposed to be another protection unit. If this piece shorts to ground, to the chassis for whatever reason, this wire is what's going to save your life. I'm just gonna put this in here because I can get in there really well with the screwdriver now and at any point in the future to really make sure that this ground is solid. Okay, well, I found reason. 
we need to add another washer to this. But effectively, this uh, screw is too long and it bottoms out inside of the T-slot before becoming effective. So I'm going to merrily borrow another washer. So I'm going to put one washer on the top side of the screw that will clamp around this cable, one washer on the bottom side, and I'll just go ahead and start it into this uh, T-nut to get it out of the hole. I guess my point is, it's really a poor idea to rely on a bolt being your source of power transmission. Um, it can be used as a source of fastening, but the point of a bolt is to actually provide a clamping force between two materials. And so what you really want to end up doing is clamping this, like just like we already clamped here, between the wire and this connector, we want to clamp this connector to our point of ground. I mean, even with these, style connectors, the bolt is not actually conducting anything. Uh, there's a metal plate on the bottom side of which takes pretty much the entire current load and transfers it to the PCB. Same with this. These are just clamped. They never actually are there and designed to be passing the current through because it's a removable object and it, its surface area, as similar to what we we're talking about with Loctite, is rather limited its amount of surface area touching. So you want to just use it as something to fasten, not to actually be the source of transmission. That goes for electricity, that goes for um, actually holding anything too. Uh, you're going to be better off if you can provide power transmission by clamping two things together and letting the friction between those two do all the holding than you are for having that direct bolt hold it um, in place. Now obviously there's cases in which that isn't exactly a viable option, namely uh, car engines and head bolts and uh, all kinds of other things, but uh, we really don't want to be using the bolts as the point of power transfer. If you can get away from it, uh, you'll save yourself or at least the next guy or the guy after that a lot of headache. Now I'll just go ahead and wrap this bad boy up around here. That's the nice thing about this box is the side frame is actually the same unit as what goes down underneath. Um, so connecting it to the side is gonna be better than connecting it to the top. Again, this top is just bolted on, so your power transmission is a little bit of surface current and a little bit of uh, bolt to get there to anything else. So you're gonna to wanna to use this main uh, rail or this main frame as your source of connection. I guess that also goes like, if a person was to be actually like really into this, I would suggest even though metal components are tightened together and there's lots of opportunities for transmission of current, probably running a ground to the top plate and the bottom plate as a fail safe would be far better than only running a ground to one of the legs. That way you have like continuous points of grounding and especially since these are the ones that are most likely to end up being affected by a short. When you have power coming right here, you'll have power coming in right here. Now it's bolted to this piece, but that piece is bolted to here. And today, this is grounded at two ends, whereas this is now only grounded at this end or come up through here, back through another leg and back down to this plate. Um, if this for some reason doesn't uh, suffice. Just some thoughts, that's all. And then, so for this one, like they actually called for putting a washer on the top and bottom side of this uh, ground cable, no bueno. Just bolt and unit, unless there's for whatever reason, like that bolt can't go in far enough, then put it washers on the outside of the bolt, outside of that ground cable, not between the ground cable, hard contact. Same thing applies between washers and bolts for power transmission, you just don't wanna do that. If possible, I mean, it would work, it will work as it has to here. My reason of accepting it here is uh, the washer isn't as flexible as the ground cable terminal. And so it'll provide a better brace when uh, pushing up against this ground leg. Against the leg, it should increase the surface area just a little bit for connect, but we have to utilize the washer as a source of power transmission. There is no options now. Nice and tight. One way I like to check these is just to push on the terminals to see if it can unloosen the bolt. Not too hard, but hard enough where like if it's not tight enough, it will come undone, but not hard enough where it'll bend something. It'll probably flex it a little bit, but just a nice little check to do. All right, we run into another questionable decision. Um, and by questionable, I say lightly. Clearly they weren't thinking too much about this and we're just putting grounds against metal spots. But the ground for the table, for the hot plate goes as follows. We have this short ground that will actually get bolted directly to the hot plate, which I appreciate because the hot plate is aluminum, probably some sort of mixture. It'll conduct electricity as well. So that'll make sure that it's grounded to uh, the carrier plate underneath it. And since, especially since they'll separate it by the uh, plastic uh, spacers for reducing heat or whatever, I don't really know. But then they connect this ground to a different bolt 
on the same carrier unit. I would much rather have two ground cables be clamped to the same bolt and that to be the source of ground transmission. So for the order of stacking, let's say this is our carrier plate. I want our main ground because this will come up and run to a ground up here. I want that to be touching the carrier plate uh, wherever that's designated. And then I want my bed ground to sit on the top side. And that order matters because this way, if anything else touches that uh, carrier plate, then it will travel through the ground cable before reaching the bed. Or if the bed fails, it will travel through the ground cable before reaching the or the carrier plate. And so, I mean, it is a massive chunk of aluminum. It'll handle the current just fine, whatever. But the point is it minimizes the path to ground and it guarantees that it's going to be traveling from this wire to this wire without any spurious effects. This wire has much lower conductivity than any sort of hands. It, not, it's just fail safes are in place. And if one ground gets loose for whatever reason, then both grounds will be loose and you'll have to uh, check on that. And I'm actually going to reverse my method of install here. I want to start at this top and this is the bed ground side. The other side goes to PSU ground. I don't really have a reason for doing it this way other than you can watch a little bit better. You can see I just kind of like push it through here, help it out, and then I'm going to help bend it down and redirect. And that'll occur for any point of which I want it to have a bend. So this is where people have commented saying, uh, put your ground in whenever you run the rest of these wires. I have a secret tool that's not so secret. Just use like something small, like an Allen wrench, and you can hook that eye hook and then drag it from chain loop to chain loop. Now she's sticking out above. And what we're gonna do is just choose the hole for the ground on the hot plate is on your side of the lead screw. And so I'm going to mount ground to the same side. That way there's no wires crossing that lead screw or even thinking about crossing it. So I think I'm actually gonna run it to the bottom of the screws. And that is because it should give a better orientation and um, that's the less necessary of the screws. I don't know. I, I really don't have a reason other than I think it'll be easier to install. <laughs> choose a washer, choose a shorty bolt here. No Loctite again. And so the funny thing is like, other steps have told us to install this. I might have did it out of order, so you can blame me. Never mind. I think what I'm gonna do is actually mount it this way. And then when all said's done, right where that crimp ends and the eye ring begins, I'm actually gonna bend that 90 degrees down towards the screwdriver, kind of like this. And so that will give it a nice direction and a nice hold and it'll keep everything tidy. Mm -hmm. 